What's up guys? This is Carl at Rare Candy, the newest member of Rare Candy. I'm gonna stop beating you over the head with that eventually, but for now, I'm Carl Barone, here to host the 2019 Knoxville, Tennessee Regional Meta Discussion, and I'm joined by two great guests, um, with Peter Kika's beautiful face in the middle of this overlay. Uh, Kika had to bounce out at the last minute, but that's all good. I'm going to talk for him anyway. Um, he's pretty vocal with his thoughts, so if you want to check out what he thinks about stuff, go ahead and hit up his Twitter. It's kind of um, on the window here to my right there, right? Anyway, I'm joined today by two great guests, guys who have been in the game for a long time, have a great deal of accomplishments in their own right, and they both represent someone's PC, uh, which is a great content creation website that I've uh, been a member of for quite a long time. You get a lot of useful info there, uh, just a stacked roster of um, authors and players that you should probably check out. But in any case, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our two guests. I have Russell Lepar, a man who probably doesn't need much of an in introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Russell has something like 30 day twos at premier events, um, <laughs> countless cup wins. Um, and he's really, he's he's a, got a real presence online, especially in groups like Hey Fonte on Facebook. Um, Russell's known for... Which I, which I own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. He's, yeah. Well, yeah, he's known for owning it, right? Um, yeah. Russell's known for <laughs> obviously owning Hey Fonte. And in addition to that, um, just being one of the realest members of the community, whether that's good or bad to you is up to you. Uh, I happen to heavily respect and appreciate Russ. Um, Russ been playing since 2013, probably most known for like pioneering Flygon at a Nationals. And uh, obviously he's the someone's PC owner in addition to the Hey Fonte owner. And then right behind him, I got Drew Bennett Kennett, who's been a really great guy to me like over the past year of me trying to get this content creation thing off the ground drew's been playing since 2005 um and he's done a ton in this game like this this is a guy that um you know he kind of flies under the radar a little bit but he definitely knows his stuff and um 2016 drew was top 16 in north america which is a crazy accomplishment um he's also won a regionals and most recently Drew got top 32 at NAIC with Blissey. So Blissey, well, they're kind of the brainchild of the Someone's PC group. Uh, really impressive accomplishment. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Russ, I want to start with you. How's it going? What are you thinking? How are you feeling? Um, good. I actually don't like the state of the game right now. Um, I think it's very, like, welder dependent. Um, I wouldn't necessarily see, a, like, it's skillless, um, because I do believe the top players are still winning. But... The method of which we obtain that, and I believe like there's always some kind of OP combo in every single format in any card game ever. Because um, you know we used to play Yu-Gi-Oh, and then now we like, used to play Versus, and now we play Pokes. That like um, there's always going to be some kind of powerful deck um, in control or some kind of powerful engine, and I just feel like the Welder one is not something that I I want to adapt to or be a part of. Even though I'm acknowledging that like there's still skill there, like I, I wouldn't say it's completely slot machine I, as I've read from a lot of people make like their hot takes on. Yeah. Um, I just think like some like if they hit welder and you don't, you just kind of lost. Uh, right. And I think towards let's try to work around that in any way possible. I also think he's just kind of a better player than everyone else there at the time. And um, the 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 tech that he played in his deck cannot be played in similar success. Um, at Knoxville, so. Other than that, yeah, I'm loving life. Yeah, good. good, man. You got your house. You got everything working there, making some moves, oh, yeah. making some money moves. Also, man. here uh, we got the um, we got the Halloween stuff from Pokemon Center. It's probably like 150 bucks there for no reason. Yeah, boy. And it's like really, really gorgeous blanket. Good. And then some I'm glad you're doing well, man. Thank you for joining me tonight. And then we got Drew. Drew, tell the people a little bit about you. I feel like you kind of fly a little bit under the radar, which, I mean, I know you well, which is great. Uh, but I want everybody else to learn a little bit more. So go ahead. You got the floor. Uh, yeah, so I've just, I've been playing Pokemon basically my whole life. Uh, it's pretty awesome. I love this game. I love the hobbies of card games and everything like that. Um, I just recently started a brand new job, which gives me weekends off and lets me travel for all the events. So I'm going to be able to start playing in more events, which I wasn't able to do the last couple of years. Um, so that's pretty sweet. I just graduated college and got a degree. Um, but yeah, just busy. Life's been good. Good. Okay, Can't complain cool. at all. Yeah, we got two guys making power moves out in life who know the game really well, and I'm I'm really looking forward to picking your brain a little bit, getting the people ready for Knoxville and potentially beyond. So we've already started with a couple really good points, and I kind of want to pick up where things left off last weekend. 
Um, so we saw Atlantic City Regionals and Cologne Regionals have the same final. And that final was featuring Mewtwo and Pidgeotto. I kind of want to start at Mewtwo, and I want to talk about where you guys think it's positioned right now in the meta, and uh, how you think about it going toward Knoxville, if there's going to be any changes that are made in popular meta decks to adapt to it, or if you think that it's just the preferred pick for top players because it allows you to do so much stuff. So I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Drew. Um, so yeah, I think Mewtwo is actually best deck in format right now. I do think Tord's list is phenomenal. I think it's significantly better than Azul's. Um, even though Azul's is still, Azul's is more basic and everything like that, but Tord's list is, I've played it, I've played against it, and it's just absolutely a phenomenal deck. Um, I would expect so much Mewtwo at Knoxville. Um, and I also think Giraffe Rig kind of just stomps the deck. So yeah. I would be, and also going on with that Giraffe Rig, I think also stomps Pidgeotto. So I think Giraffe Rig is a huge tech that needs to be into everyone's deck this coming weekend. That is really smart. Um, I haven't even thought about that. And that is, um, that's a great way to lead off this conversation. So, so thanks, Drew. Russ, I want to get your thoughts on Mewtwo as well. Uh, I think Mewtwo is easily best deck in format. Um, I think that the strengths behind it, like I discussed earlier, um, in particular from Tord's List, that breaks that welder necessity um, that some people, you know, can't hit because they don't draw that way. Or, um, you know, they, they choose to get teched for by particular matchups or definitely taken out by the strengths of Hapu. Um, and Red's Challenge, which I've been gassing for, like, what, three months now, Drew? Four months? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I've, yeah. Been, since, I've been talking about Red's Challenge World. since Aerodactyl dropped. Um, or, like, before, right before Worlds. And I, was like, I think we're all kind of sleeping on how strong this card is, especially with the Den in the format. And um, the fact that they play four, four to Den kind of backs that up. Like, you absolutely need this card right now. And it can swing the game in your favor, um, similar to what Computer Surge had uh, and expanded, but less, you know, combo-oriented stuff. Um, I was going to mention Giraffe Rig, but you already did it, and that's what I love to hear. Uh, Lysander's Labs also can be played a little bit more often to, um, you know, get the one poke off of uh, the Shedinja. But, uh, yeah, in, in general, the fact that the weakness energy um, got added to it makes the deck really, really smooth. And I know personally from playing like a Blounds list and a, and a Quagmag list is if if someone bends the Jirachi early and I was lucky enough to get into like a custom catcher, I would just pop off the Jirachi. Like it was no problem. Go for a, a, a burst GX and then um, use Baby Naga to one shot the Mewtwo at the end. Um, that'll all be removed and taken away once you get the weakness energy on there. Um, I don't believe, I, I've heard some people talk about online that people might add in like Tech Faba now um, for both the weakness energy. As well as the stadium, I don't think that's necessary at all, especially when it's a, it's such a dead card in so many matchups, and it's a waste of a support in an already semi um, inconsistent format outside of like power plant judge. So if you're if you're lucky enough to rip into your one Faba with a cherish ball and the Dan off of like a turn one judge and power plant, or that one turn that you needed to do, then they didn't stamp you. Um, you know, I think you're just super lucky to get there, and you're kind of just wasting that space. I'd rather just have a, a baby Mar Shadow. Um, to get rid of whatever statement in play, uh, to handle it that way. Yeah, I've always been enamored with Red's Challenge, and I've always tried to use it a lot in uh, decks where I would run, like, Zeb Striker or something, and it always felt really good. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like you like you touched on, Dedenne just makes it a powerful, a, just a powerful piece to have. You know, it's essentially a computer search, which obviously we've seen the extent of in, a, in expanded format just being a completely busted card on every account. Um, with or without propagation, just having the ability to get whatever you need. Um, so I think those two ideas are really, really cute. And I think Tord's List does kind of change things a little bit going forward. And uh, I'm I'm more thankful to have played last week as opposed to this upcoming week. So those are some really good ideas. And I kind of want to circle back around to a deck that I, uh, I don't touch control-y kind of decks too often. Um, the only time I do is when I want to ruin people's streaks on PTCGO. Um, so I want to, <laughs> I want to ask you guys what you think about Pidgeotto. Um, I've played around with it a little bit and I really like it. Um, do you think it's as, well, I should rephrase. I kind of thought it was a good call for AC if you can get it down. And obviously Grant, you know, is a mastermind and he got it down. Um, do you, I'll start with you, Russ. Do you think that Pidgeotto is equally powerful as it was two weeks ago? Do you think it's easily played around? How do you feel about that style of deck overall for this weekend? I think the speed at which you have to play it 
and the player, like the pilot behind it, definitely reflects its strength. And if you're not comfortable with this game in a way that you just theorize it all day and you live and breathe it like Grant does, um, I'm not sure you'll have the same success uh, with it. I do think it's strong, though. I do think it's easily counterable. Um, and the clock is also a big, big issue um, with piloting the deck. So I think it's strong. Would I ever play in a tournament? No. Yes. Ever. Like in any in any kind of cup, any kind of like big name regional ever. I'm I was I would never want to touch control. Um, Drew's that person on our team playing the whack decks like that. So like he'll be able to speak to it more. But yeah, I just I wouldn't want to touch it. Yeah, it seems like after a while, after a couple of rounds, it just gets pretty exhausting too. Um, that was my vibe that I caught from it after maybe five or ten games. Drew, do you have any thoughts on on Pidgeotto as a whole as a uh, as the yeah. someone's PC control guy or whack deck guy? Yeah, I have a couple actually. So Pidgeotto, I think the time for Pidgeotto is over already uh, because like Russell said, it's so easily countered. If someone plays a Drapper, it gets over. If someone plays a Naranguru, it's over. And those are cards that are going to see more play because they're good against other decks, not just Control. People took out the Orangurus of their decks because Control just wasn't really good and Oranguru didn't do much other than be Control. So I do think that people are going to put those sort of cards into their decks because they have more value now. Um, that being said, I personally haven't played much Pidgeotto. Um, I more always like the Sheninja, uh, Zebstrika variant of the control deck, um, which is less energy denial and more just your opponent doesn't ever take a prize. That version I actually think is also very good, just like Pidgeotto, but also has the same issues as Pidgeotto where once people start countering it, you really can't do anything. Um, but I personally think that Sheninja Zepstrika is just as good as the Pidgeotto deck. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. Also, cool. also, I just want to add to this that, yeah. Drew, you're not going to Knoxville, right? You're no, I'm, I'm unfortunately. I yeah, yeah. Neither of us going to Knoxville. So if you're thinking, like, we're telling you add in Giraffe Rig so we can be all these, like, <laughs> Like, we're not. We're literally only telling you, like, this is how you beat people. Like, how you beat this yeah. people. Like, like, like yeah. we have no incentive, because the next time we're going to play, it's going to be, like, expanded, or a new set's going to drop. We're telling you, throw in Giraffe Rig. Yeah. It's so right. I'm, I'm not trying to... I want you guys to beat all these cancers. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, we really want to see you just knock them out of there and start having more exciting games. Let's not have Pidgeotto in finals again. No, no, not at all. We want you guys to cite this video on Monday morning when you come back from a triumphant day two run and say you know what that drew guy that russ lapari whatever his name is they're on to something right like they're they know what they're talking about so very good guys i love it um so yeah um last week we saw three picaroms make top eight after weeks it felt like of people kind of sleeping on it maybe not thinking it's very good thinking it's like middle of the road like might get you there might not um do you guys think there's what what is what happened and what is there a newfound viability in Picaram? Did it never leave? Were people just playing it wrong or building it wrong? What happened and and where is it now compared to where we were sitting two weeks ago? Um, I'll go ahead and start with Russ on this one. Uh, I don't think it ever left. I just think the top players stopped playing it, especially this version. I mean, I guess I kind of feel that way. Um, Judge Power Plant's a good combo to make your opponent not play the game. And that's pretty much what felt like happened, is they would reset Stamp plus Power Plant, make a huge comeback. Um, people stopped, maybe stopped testing that matchup, and they stopped using Raichu uh, Choo Choo correctly, the um, tag team. So, I don't know. It, it takes a good um, Picaron pilot to find success over the long course of a tournament in standard. Um, I think in expanded you can just do whatever, <laughs> just go crazy, because <laughs> like it's a way different deck. But uh, but in terms of like skill and what the deck has, it it really feels like um, kind of the new Zoroark to me. Really, like has has Zoroark used to go like N plus some kind of like crazy combo or like N Garbodor, and then just slowly grind you out of the games. Yeah. So that's how I feel like whenever I play against Pika Rum. Like once I take a knockout, I have to prep myself for um, power plan reset stamp, and have to like correctly map out prizes and yeah that's a really uh, I, I, no, I, I think i think the deck's good i think it, it needs a good pilot behind it um 
I wouldn't be lucky enough to. My opponent would definitely like rib Lily or like <laughs> well, a welder with a uh, with a what's it called hearth like off the top of my reset stamp. Yeah. So I'm not trying to answer that at all. Man, I felt that pain this past weekend after I magical miracled him into custom catcher into coach trainer. <laughs> That's like no yeah. what? No yeah. him? <laughs> I did it to him. I'm like, yo, is mirror? This is locked up. And we'll talk about Guardian later, but yikes. Um so yeah, that's actually a really interesting comparison that you drew. Um that actually makes me think a little bit. And that's a super oppressive combo. And I feel like people are playing like different supporter lines and they can't figure out the right one. I think Judge is by far the best one. Um and yeah, it does it does feel pretty oppressive. Um Drew, do you have any thoughts on Pikarum? Yeah, actually, I'm in a completely different boat than you guys. Um, I think that Pikaram is extremely powerful, um, but I disagree with the Judge version. I think Pedro's version from top four in Germany's regionals that they had last weekend, um, I think that's actually way better uh, because it's built around pure consistency. This is not a, this is a Pikaram deck that knows if I set up and if I go fast, I'm going to win because my the power level of my deck is just too high. Um, so it's like, instead of the judges, he plays Bill's Analysis. So his supporters are just Bill's Analysis and Volkner's. So he is getting those tag switches. He's getting those electric magnetic radars. Um, and he's just going to explode onto the board. And then he also gets, he's playing all the techs. He's playing the Zapdos as a one prize that could just poke and chip damage. He's playing the Electros, which I think is actually really powerful right now because of all the Keldeos running around and just random stuff like that, uh, being able to get around Mewtwo's um, tag purge. Um, and then he plays the Hoopa in order to uh, help against the Malmar matchup. What I do think in his deck I would add is either that Oranguru or the um, Drafrig. I think in Pikaram that Oranguru is, a, is slightly better just because getting back those custom catchers can be just detrimental to winning the game. Um, but I do like going the consistency route of Pikaram instead of the trying to disrupt my opponent. Because Pikaram is just such a strong deck. Why do you need your opponent to dead draw? You really don't. You just need to do what you need to do because it's so powerful. Yeah. And um, the Bill's analysis to me was interesting to see. Um, I played against Justin Bokari in day two, first round of day two at Atlantic City. And... <clears throat> He played a Bills analysis, and it got him, like, the absolute gas. And I was like, ooh. I'm like, why Why is this not a thing? And then, lo and behold, I get home 12 hours later, and I'm like, oh, Pedro's deck was pretty good. Let's see. And, lo and behold, there's Bills. So I think there's a lot of merit to Bills, too. Um, Picaram is such a versatile deck to me because you could play so many different supporter lines and still get there. Um so, I mean, it's it's good to hear that it's that you guys think it's pretty well positioned because as, as I've been playing around with it more, I feel like it's it's pretty powerful. Um, I don't know where all the like the negative hype came from, like over the two or two weeks or so leading up to Atlantic City, but um, Pikram is probably what I would play with a bunch of labs and, and a power plant. Um, but that's another conversation. So anyway, for the whole month of September, we uh, we're seeing cups and like talk and articles about ability zard ability zard is the best deck 18 energy 16 energy a baby blown four crystal three crystal whatever do you guys still think that ability zard is a viable deck is green zard better and what is the proper uh energy count to crystal count in your eyes if you've been playing with it um and if not just maybe a quick theory would be good so we could start with drew on this one if you're playing charizard and it's not mewtwo then I think you're wrong. Um, I don't like the ability version of Charizard. I think it dead draws more than anything in the world. I think that it doing so well at Worlds was just because it wasn't expected. But that deck is not consistent. Um, not consistent enough, especially with people adding in power plants and things like that into their deck. Um, and then greens, I just think the power level is too low of that deck. So if I'm playing Charizard, it's definitely going to just be in a Mewtwo deck. Okay. A lot of the Mewtwo's I played last week had cut the Reshizard. Oh, yeah. I super disagreed with that. Weird. In, in every way possible. Weird. I not agree with that at all. Every single one I played, they played Muck Muck. And then, Ugh. and then, um, so for anyone watching, I played Guardian last week. Um, and I did okay. Um, but anyway, they also had cut Baby Marshadow. 
Like I never saw Baby Marshadow, <laughs> and that was like that was like the most confusing thing to me because like the board state is like Mewtwo with a ton of energy, and like my Guardian, and I'm like, okay, he's gonna knock out my Guardian. He's gonna treasure for the Marshadow, put it on the bench, bounce my plant, and then I'm gonna lose to Lava Flow next turn. And no one ever did that. Like, that's the way you beat Guardian. And they never did it. And then I asked them after the game, they're like, oh, I don't run it. And that's, both of those decisions were insane to me. Like, I get the Muck Muck and it's cute and it gets around Psychic Charm and stuff like that. But, like, I was just so perplexed by that. But anyway, Russ, do you have any, do you have any thoughts on Ability Zard, Green Zard, any variation of Zard that's not in Mewtwo? I thought Ability Zard's still strong. I just think it's inconsistent. Mm-hmm. I do, I do think it's strong, though. Um, I definitely don't agree with the no Zard version, where you just play all, all one prizers. I super disagree yeah. with that. Like, I was, I was like, going... I was tying with it and beating it with Blounds, and that shouldn't be a thing. Like, it should just be a landslide on their end. Yeah. Um, and, like, in general, I mean, what about it is more attractive to you than just playing a Mewtwo, outside of the fact that Giraffery could be a thing now? Um, to which you can also play around sometimes, depending on the list and how you flow with it. Um, I don't see how Tords can, because like if you hop in the wrong things, they're like they're after. <laughs> Boy, it's okay. okay you can't but, attack. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, uh, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, maybe the. Um, but I, 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 would, would I play it at Knoxville? Absolutely not. That or Greens. I don't think Greens is honestly all that successful again with the power level thing that Drew just talked about. Like I'd, I'd rather play Quagnag and throw in a Draftery <laughs> than I would pick up again, because um, you're playing a Welder deck, but I don't even think it's like the best deck to Welder in. So, yeah, I think the draft rig thing could pick up some steam after this one goes live tomorrow. Uh, Absolutely. I guess I'll have Probably to see there. that. We'll just have to pick on. That's super cute. Um, okay, so we'll go. We'll move on to a personal favorite of mine, uh, which is Gardevoir Sylveon. Uh, I've been a since Ju- I remember July first. I built the deck, and I was like, you know, this card has a really busted attack, and I think that it could be viable. And then what I found was that it was actually really good, and you could make it do whatever you wanted it to do. Um, then as the list has grown from, uh, you know, the Japanese players bringing it to Worlds to I think it was Carl Peters getting 10th at Worlds with it, uh, to St- Stefan, um, to other players too, just trying it out, trying different one-ofs that are searchable via greens, etc. I think the deck has grown into being something that's actually legitimately powerful. Um, but I don't want to let my bias get in the way. I want to hear from some some pros. So, um, Russ, what do you think about Guardian as a whole? Maybe um, where it's come from Worlds, where it is now, its viability overall. It doesn't beat good players that play good decks. And why? Like, Because like, one, they're not going to play a deck that usually just runs into an auto loss uh, against the Charms. Because you'll probably see that. I played against three at AC, by the way. Wow. Are these uh, easy claps? <laughs> oh, like, ho- hopefully they're listening. Just don't like. I played Blounds and they had like the Ultra Beast uh, Charm, and I was like, oh, I, I just played double um, Lysander Labs. Everyone runs Heatran. Like, I don't know. Just I, I wouldn't play it. I don't. I don't feel like most of the games are at a level of which my 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 like personal skill um, adds no legitimate value to me winning the games. Because I just feel like you either win because you have your charms out and you're going to beat them, or they're really bad and they're going to play into you like stamping them and then using um or like like a bad stamp, a bad custom catcher, something that like Guardi works off of and then using their GX attack to beat them. Like I, I don't I don't think you beat good players that are prepared um, with that deck. You, I, I think you definitely don't beat any Mewtwo. Um, at least the version I would play because I would just play Rushy's Zard and call it a day, but. Yeah, that was my experience last week. I played against the Blounds, and it it, it wasn't too hard. Um, I didn't see a lot of Heatran, strangely. Um, in Abilities Art or anything? I saw Heatran in Abilities Art, but not in Blounds. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Well, what, what'd you lose to Day 2, not the rag on you? And birds. Like bring up your losses. But, but, yeah, so Birds. I lost to Birds, I lost to Abilities Art, and I lost to Bokari playing Pikaram. Gotcha. And that was Isn't Pikachu usually free until they play the triple labs on you? Uh, well, I will say that he is way better than me. And yeah. I showed. <laughs> um, and he has historically always had my number in premier events. Um, but he's a homie, and uh, 
I kind of threw by not moving my energy properly, and he took advantage of it, and that was it. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like it's a pretty favorable matchup with two charm. Um, but, I mean, you know, there's, you always have to account for... You can't just look at decks, right? You have to account for who's piloting what. And, you know, you... In day two, it's a whole different beast, which I uh, kind of found out pretty quickly that morning. It's 7.30 in the morning. Jeez. Um, Drew, do you have any additional thoughts on Guardian as an archetype and its viability? I think Guardian's really good, and I bring it up constantly in our Someone's PC chat. Um, Stras, bro. <laughs> but my biggest, my biggest issue with it right now is I think because of what did well, Guardian also just gets hurt by just collateral yeah, damage. Collateral. Uh people adding in Lysander's lab to try to get around Sheninja. That hurts Guardian too just without trying to. Because without those fairy charms, some matchups that should be like you don't win match some matchups unless you have the fairy charms. Like just if Blounds decides to put back in the one Lysander's lab, that could just end it. Mm -hmm. That could just be the end of the game. They knock out the first one and then Nag can come up and just constantly is hitting for 160 type of thing. Yeah. Um, so I think that just collateral damage hurts that deck a lot, and I wouldn't feel comfortable playing it this weekend for that reason. Yeah, and I was all on it last week, and this week, if I was going, I wouldn't touch the deck with the 10-foot pole. Um, Cups over the weekend showed us that it's gaining a lot of popularity. I went to a 21 Master Cup on Saturday. There were six Guardians in the room. Jeez. Um, and I lost to two mirrors, and I dropped. Um, <laughs> that were really heavy on heal, and really good at drawing out a magical miracle. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I wouldn't touch the deck personally if it was me. Um, I think it's going to be very popular, much more popular than it was at AC. I think my logic going into the tournament was, like, if I hit Zard, I hit Zard. I don't think it's a hard auto loss, but it's certainly difficult. It's not like birds where, like, Ian flipped over a Pidgey, and I'm like, okay, peace. Like, <laughs> I'm just going to go get some lunch or something. Um, but this weekend, I think that Guardian's in a bad spot because you could play a lot of mirrors, and if you don't have the extra healing, that literally only helps that mirror and Malamar. Um, you just have dead cards in your deck, generally. So I think Guardian will do poorly this weekend by virtue of how popular it's gotten and people not necessarily knowing how to play Mirrors. And then like the people who win those will just lose to like really good players playing Mewtwo who are playing it the right way now. Um, so yeah, I don't think Guardian is as well positioned as it was um, for AC. But I guess we'll see, right? Um, so I kind of want to take the attention off the meta. I don't... I mean, we could talk about Blounds, but Blounds is Blounds, right? Like, it's just kind of, it's it, it's got it's got its build. It does the same thing. Um, you know, you could throw in a Lysander Lab like Russ had touched on. Um, there's a couple different I, things I you could do. Two. Huh? <laughs> I played two. <laughs> two? You played two? I, I played two Lysander Labs and two Switch. I wasn't losing to, like, any of that madness. I tied three times due to awkward starts and then my opponent uh, maybe playing a little bit slow. And then I had like a massive advantage in game three. And I lost one round to Greenzard because he went reset stamp me to five power plant both games. And I lost because of it. So that was kind of frustrating. Um, uh, I also didn't play reset stamp, which was a regret. So if you're playing Blounds, play one or two reset stamp. It's really good. It was dumb of me not to play. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, stamp. Obviously, we're in like a huge like... Stamp is like, I don't, Stamp has been so weird to track, like, since its release, right? Like, there are people who are playing, like, Heavy Stamp, which is a, generally not a good idea, and then people, like, throwing one into stuff where it's, like, unsearchable, which also doesn't seem like a good idea, um, but now it, feel, it feels like if you play, like, two or three Stamp, and then just, like, hit one timely one, like, you just take over the game, um, and I feel like that card has undergone the most, like, transformation from, when did it release, August to now? Um, mm -hmm. kind of almost a format defining card to me. Um, yeah, it's super imbalanced. No, no, no drawback. Really good. <laughs> no cap. Super unbalanced. Um, yeah. So I mean, that's another that's another video in itself. But anyway, I kind of want to turn my attention over to rogue decks. I know rogue decks are few and far between because we're kind of in like a big basic kind of kind of meta game. But I know you two love them. 
and I would love to give you a chance to talk about anything strange or weird or new or different that you might have that you might think has potential um, going forward, maybe for Knoxville or Cups afterwards. So I would love to start with Drew on this one. All right. So I have two decks that are roguish that I, I love. The first one is obviously Quagnag because I love that deck. Um, and I think Quagnag is extremely powerful. Um, I've just been pil- piloting it all season so far. And I did come in uh, to contact with Tord's uh, Mewtwo deck and got destroyed. Um, so then I added in Giraffe Rig and destroyed it because they actually don't have a win condition once you get rid of their Greninja. Um, but so I love Quagnag. Um, I play the one Giraffe Rig. I play the Palkia GX, which is something people aren't playing. But it kind of just wins every matchup. Dumb. Puck is busted. Like, it actually just... Best cards that, that game. That's the one card people... I don't know why they're not playing it. I don't know if they just don't know if it's a card. But that GX attack, Zero Vanishing, just kind of wins everything. It's disgusting how good it is. Um, so I love Quagnag. If I was going this weekend, I would be playing that 100%. Um, I'm going to be playing it at my cup this weekend, just like I did last weekend. Um, And then the other deck that I don't think anyone's even tried testing other than my friend Danny Prather from Arizona. Um, He's been playing the Bird Trio, the Articuno, Moltres, Zapdos tag team. Um, And I think that the deck's actually really powerful. You get to play the two best supporters in the game right now in Welder and Volkner. And you just play four of each and that's your engine which normally doesn't go together, but just a turn one welder to the birds into a Volkner turn two to get that lightning energy and then get a rainbow brush so that you can rainbow brush away a fire for the water and you can do that GX attack turn two if you want to. Oh my God. Um, And then the fallback is you're playing lightning. So you still play the lightning package and you have like Zapdos, Tapu Koko Prism, Raichu Raichu. So you still get that as a fallback strategy to finish out the game because uh, the Bird's GX attack doesn't just win the game, but it gets you a lot of advantage. So that's something he's been working on a lot, and I've been I've been right there next to him, helping him and trying to make it work because it is very it's a very cool deck, and I think if someone someone puts the time into that deck, they'll do well. Could you remind us what the GX attack does again? So the GX attack um, for one colorless energy and then you need a fire a water and a lightning um to do the extra effect (laughs) it does it does 110 damage to three of your opponent's pokemon and then you get to shuffle the 300 hp tag team back into your deck okay so you get to do 110 to three pokemon yes fly away what's up you do 110 to three pokemon then you fly away you fly away yeah. yeah And then you can be gone. You're 300 out. HP, you're so out. it's never going to be much We out. <laughs> and you can do it turn two because Volker and Welder are broken. Dude, that... that Wow, that was what we paid for, man. <laughs> All right, Russ, I, I got to ask you to follow that one, man, but it, it might be hard. If I went to Knoxville, I would play Behem, 100%. Behem! 1,000% I'd be playing Behem. I'd be playing the... um. Uh, Fouché's version. Oh yeah, Space Cadets. Yeah, oh, all right. Yeah. I'd one thousand percent be playing that deck with my own spicy tech involved. Um, okay. Because they went like pure consistency, and knowing me, uh, I'm down for all that. I want to. I would drop a few cards and play so much tech that people would get very, very upset. And I'm really, really good with hit and run decks. Not to like, <laughs> you know, like not to, to my own horn, but hit and run runs were good. Don Fan, Gore, like, love it. Awesome. But uh, yeah, I play Behem. I think it uh, you'd roll like most of the format. I don't see how you lose to Picaram when you have um, two two a low and nine tails with double Brock's grit. That seems like a, a very easy dump. There. Yeah, and um, I don't know. Deck is like super consistent. Uh, the the Gondel GX engine instead of the Pidgeotto engine is just phenomenal. I would definitely play that instead. Um, I really fell in love with the Gondel GX after playing Blounds. I like I really just like this card. Drawing three cards feels very nice, especially when you thin your card, like thin a card out of your hand. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be playing Behem if I actually went, 
And uh, I'd probably add in a draft ring just to um, auto win a few matchups. And I'm trying to think what else I would play. You already beat Pidgeotto, so not many people to play against. Um, is there anything to really worry about? You got <laughs> no. You beat Guardian big time. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Behem. I was I was very nervous for. Um, yeah. Luckily, nobody has any guts. So yeah. Uh, yeah, man, those are really good suggestions, and I am positive we're gonna see a giraffe rig and a top eight deck list or two after this video drops. I have no doubt. Um, and you can send those props right to these two. Um, oh, we're going to do one more thing. Um, I know Peter's thoughts about Malamar. I know my thoughts about Malamar. Do you guys have any positive thoughts about Malamar? Trash. Yeah, it's trash. Drew, what do you think? Uh, they're not the most positive. Deck's fine. Yeah. That's all. It's not good. It's I would never play it anymore. Yeah. If you want to go 414, play Malamar, right? Lose to yourself. Buddy. I think Malmar, you can you can get some points, but if you're trying to win the tournament like you should be, you should never play that deck. Yeah. Okay, that's about. What well, I if you're just trying to get points, Drew, what are you what are you playing? Just points. If just trying to get points, just trying I to get. Think if you want easy points, I think Behem is the easy points. Okay, that's I was gonna go with that. Whoa. Too. Yeah, Behem is easy. If points. you're there just trying to make like you can just making day two X two Behem baby. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're trying to just get some points, Behem, 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 and you you got those points. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, anyone who knows me and the channel and, like, some of the stuff that I do off the channel for, like, you know, myself and for Rare Candy knows that I'm super big on personal development, goal setting, motivation, getting better, right? Like, I always like to introduce an element of getting better to the channel, and I love asking these top upper echelon players about how do you get better? What, what was your turning point? What was the thing that you added to your routine or your testing or your practice or whatever that kind of took you to the next level. Um, I always try to introduce a segment like this into my meta podcast or any podcast that I do for that matter. And um, I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring that to light here. And I would love to hear from both of these guys about what it is. Maybe it's a small thing. Maybe it's a big thing. What um, what advice would you have to somebody who's looking to get really competitive this season, who's been having a hard time, or who's been kind of plateauing a little bit as far as uh, taking that next step, not to elite status, but just consistent point getter for example so russ we'll go we'll start with you here um don't try and be cute and unique uh leave that for people that know how to really do that like creating road decks it's more so of like playing the powerful meta stuff and then learning the ins and outs of why those cards are there um and the reasoning behind it so um for me i was i was a trash player for like the first two or three months of me playing and then i found flygon and i kind of just took off um, because Flygon required a lot of thinking, a lot of math, and a lot of weird counts about cards that um, I normally wouldn't be able to like work with. I think the same thing can be said about Mewtwo right now, honestly. I think um, there are certain things players can do in Mewtwo matchups um, that generate a higher advantage um, over the opponent. And I don't know. I, I don't remember the last time I saw a bad player or relatively lower quality player beat a good player with with Mewtwo in a mirror match. Um, if not a, a mirror match, that was like completely roll. So um, I've always thought if you really want to strive to improve very, very quickly, you learn the hardest deck in the format and you learn how to pilot it over and over and over again. And I don't believe, at least for me, that actually physically playing and getting reps did a single thing for me. I think most of it was just sitting back and theory moning and then playing those like solutions and theories I had in my head out onto the actual game state. And if it didn't work, I just scrapped it and went back um, with the same level of thinking. Okay. So, um, yeah, I would, I would copy paste what people are playing online, figure out why they're playing it without ever asking anyone else any questions. Like, like there's hitting up a player, hey, why'd you play this? And like, they just kind of spoon feed it to you. Um, and that's only really to save time. But mo majority of the time, it's like when you see a list, it's like, oh, why is he playing this? Play the deck for yourself. Oh, and now I see like why that's there, why this count is here, and, and why small things are being changed up. Um, I will say I do believe, um, like I said earlier, that this format's skillful, but it's it's not to a point where I think that it's like um, – how do you say? It's not like it was back then as – hipster and dumb as that sounds like i feel like back then when we were playing flag on like when i just started playing 
um, that there was so much different thinking going on than there is now, especially the way supporters are and the way um, energy gets vomited out on board now, um, unlike, unlike anything I've ever seen. At least outside of Blastoise, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. I, I just think like the, it's, it's hard to explain the skill gap I had when I first joined and like, um, got better as a player as opposed to it is now. But, um, one thing would be is like you're pretty much just theory mining, um, all things to yourself and and learning how to read a meta shifting, and what text you should be playing in place of it, um, and really balancing out like the perfect sixty in your head. Uh, without anyone's like advice or help for them to spoon feed it to you, like coming up with the answers on your own is a lot better way of coming about it. And I think that's why me and Drew end up playing like rogue decks, is because we just kind of understand what everyone's gonna play. Um, and the success we found is when we actually play serious decks that just happen to be very funny, like Drew with Waylord or Greninja. When you know, not many people were on. Some people were on Greninja at the time, I think. And then me with like Zoropod and and like Stoys. Like, like how, how you and me read that Stoice going into t- uh, Toronto. I was like, I don't know what to play. What would I play? And you're like, Stoice is easily the best deck. And I've literally never played Archie Stoice in my life before that event. And I just learned it in the first four rounds. And it really just came down to, like, me sitting down. I was like, Drew, what do I do in this matchup? Because I think you do this, this, and this, and this, and this. And he's like, yes, that's precisely what you do. But make sure you do this, too. And I was like, all right, great. And, like, to get to that level, it's it's more so me just thinking on my own. Um and then making the correct meta call for it. And you you, you do have to play something good. Like me, me and you play rogue decks because we can easily get our invite whenever we feel like it. And can be and can afford to like throw these tournaments away. And, and if you feel like you're not in the same position, or if you confidently know that you're not going to find the same success that we have, don't do it. Play something meta, get your points, play good decks, play against other decks that you know how to beat, stuff like that. Um, watching VODs is really good too, with streams. Mm-hmm. Like watching top players of why they do what they do and when they do it. Not just, oh, he hit this, so it's time for him to do this. It's like, no, no, no. There's the reason why he got to the current game set that he's at. There's a reason why his opponents are punting. Um, so Awesome. I mean, that, yeah. That pretty much like All right. Saying. Drew, go ahead and follow up on that if you can. That was really good. Yeah, so this is actually perfect because uh, I have a completely different approach than Russell. Mm-hmm. And what he just said uh, proves that both ways actually do work because what he just said about the Archie's Blastoise when he played it for Toronto how he was like yeah I think I do this and this and he, him and I were talking the entire event yeah. because like it was I was supposed to go we were supposed to play the deck together but my flight got cancelled um, so I was with him every step of that way for that tournament and he was like I think I do this and this and I was like yeah you want to do that but also don't forget about this thing which is something that I personally figure out by actually test playing the deck because yep. i i am someone who thinks repetition is good but my repetition is not i you if you go into play testing with the like competitive drive that all, every card player has like we play this game because we're competitive people and we enjoy pokemon yeah. um so if you go into play testing with the competitive mindset of i want to win you're not going to get any better whatsoever when I go and I play test and I actually sit down and play test, I actually play with my hand face up and I talk with my friend who I'm playing against. And I was like, okay, so here are my lines of play. I can do this, this, and this, but if you have this, that, this, then it's wrong. I just lose. Yeah. <laughs> but what if, but what are the chances of that happening over, um, something else happening? So it's, a lot of just learning the reps and talking through it. There's no reason to, I, I think winning in a playtesting match is actually that it's kind of irrelevant. You're playtesting to learn the deck. You're playtesting to learn strategies. And you want to see options that come up that you may not think of. There's little things that happen that you may not think of. Um, and that's where playtesting comes in. But you have to talk about it. Talk about your the moves you make. See if it's actually going to be the best play. Take a line of play that maybe you wouldn't normally do. And then if you lose because of it, you know for sure. But if you win because you took a chance and you had to do this line of play specifically, and then you end up winning, you're like, okay, cool. That was actually a good strategy. That was a good play. Maybe I can build on this and make the matchup that much more favorable for me. Yeah. Um, The other thing that I think is a really big deal, and I personally got better when I started realizing, and what I tell to a lot of people is knowing matchups is really an important thing. Russell touched on learning the best deck. I think learning or getting a general grasp of every deck is very important 
because if you're going into a matchup and you know it's unfavorable because you've played against it um, and you know like it's just, well, this isn't favorable for me, then you have to play differently. You can't just, if you and your opponent both set up who's going to win in an unfavorable matchup, your opponent is. Thinking skill level is similar. Um, who's going to win if both players set up? Well, the person who has a favorable matchup is going to win. So what you have to do is you have to take those chances. You have to take a couple extra chances and hope that a couple you get a little bit lucky and hope some cards go right for you. But if you're the person with the favorable matchup, your goal should be to go and get set up because you know if both of you guys just set up, you will end up winning the game because you have the good matchup. Awesome. That's like a super analytical view that I commonly overlook. Um, and I think that's super helpful. Um, yeah, and I don't, to, to touch on that too, like um, not only is it, it's like the matchup, but it's like the resources and, and how they're dedicated in particular ways um, that really like exploit top players' abilities to outplay um, lower level, uh, especially in regards to like control decks. So like with Drew playing Whale Lord, he understood that like, all right, this deck can't do all this, so this is an easy win for me. And his opponents think, like, oh, I think I'm going to win. I'm going to beat this. And he's like, no, you're not. Like, watch this. And, and for me, like, when I was playing Zoropod, just decking people out, I did that, like, four or five times a tournament just because I played a single guru. Mm -hmm. And, like, you, you notice, like, well, their attachment's here or, like, your opponent, um, like, their facial expressions or certain things that's, like, you notice off of them and, like, and how they're attaching, like, their escape wards or how they're attach or, like, how they're benching their Jirachi, how they're playing their PCOMs. It gives off a lot of tells um, that kind of, like, let you know the resources that are currently at your opponent's expense, especially with prizes being in the game. Yeah. So like I like I've seen tons of people like PCOM look through the deck and like make a face or like roll their eyes or, so, or like breathe differently um, than they typically normally would. And I'm like, you're an idiot. Now I know like you're gonna <laughs> prize. And then they're like, oh okay, I'm gonna do this, do this. And then my, my line my line of play goes from prepping for when they like go for the Victini to just like sheer if that has fire on it, it's getting knocked out. Or like I see their face and I was like, oh you only have one Jirachi? I'm gonna custom catch up you and kill your Jirachi. Instead of the thing with the fire on it, and then their hands just dead. Yeah, it's because like you can start picking things off based on the resources, mm -hmm. but that comes in time. It's it's really all about like learning the like the first steps about the game, yeah. how how things are dedicated. Um, the best player yeah. that I ever saw do that, um, that I actually watched. So every time I watch Isaiah Williams play, he does that. He'll stare you down, and he'll just watch your eyes after <laughs> like a, some kind of you know, maybe like in a Sikkim or Juniper or something. Um, I've never seen anything like it. And that taught me a lot about what Russ was talking about because it's actually really telling. Um, mm -hmm. And it's advanced level stuff. Like if you've played poker or maybe a different card game, that might have been more important, like making reads and stuff like that. Um, but I think that's a super underrated skill for like the upper echelon players for sure. And I see a lot of top level players actually doing that. Um so yeah, shout out to Isaiah. I, I, I see him do that all the time, and it's really impressive to me that that level of psychology is happening in a game where you pretty much have access to your entire deck, um, and you're still able to make those kind of calls and just kind of get all the information you can, like as 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 complete of information about this game you can get. Um, and that's super. That's that's hard to get to, but it's certainly valuable. So that's like that's really that's really intelligent. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so we've come to the pretty much the end of our of our meta discussion here. I want to give Drew and Russ an opportunity to. Uh, I think they're familiar with each other. They're going to shout out their, the teams they belong to and and what they're <laughs> doing, what they have going on, where you could find them because these are two guys that have a lot of really great thoughts. Um, two guys that I've grown to respect heavily and who've really influenced my brief stint here as a content creator so i'm gonna go ahead and i think i'll start with russ here uh russ you go ahead and plug whatever you want any shout outs any where, where can we find you man um i'm on twitter at r lapar and i'm on facebook at russell lapar um i just talk mad trash uh the whole <laughs> time I'm really abrasive and blunt about things um we need it man but i feel like i feel like people like not only do they love that sometimes they need that and this like uh, in my opinion, fake uh, particular top players of the community oh. that are just trying to get like uh, their uh, their sponsorships and, and get everything out there oh, wow. and and like they're they're making like a meme of their influence like of meta manipulation and they think it's like mad funny to crack jokes about it but they legitimately actually do, <laughs> do it. 
<laughs> so super, super funny to hear about. Um, yeah. At the same time, shout out to someone's PC. I own the team, and to call us a team would be like, I don't know. <laughs> we're just a bunch of homies that we were all friends before we ever made the team, and it just all kind of worked out. We made our own website. Yeah. Um, the website is someonespc.com. Uh, we're sponsored by Flipside Gaming, which is a card game store operating out of New York. Mm-hmm. Um, they have uh, prices comparable to TCG Player. So that's really nice to work with. We're also sponsored by Ultimate Guard, who at first seemed very unknown, but they kind of just worked their way into everything. And they kind of took over Magic. Like they sponsored a lot of Magic people a lot. And um, other than that, I don't think we're on any, any teams. I'm, I'll let Drew speak to whatever he wants. But. <laughs> Yeah, cool. I mean, it's always good to get a bunch of homies together playing, playtesting, having the group chat, caring about each other's lives. It's like a it's like a genuine thing, you know? It's not just, I need to use you for a list for an event, right? It's like, hey. It's genuinely a surprise sometimes when we're talking about the card game. Yeah. Like, 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 like sometimes when we're like messaging each other and we're actually talking about decks, so I was like, oh, what's going it's on? It's weird, today? right? It's, it's like, like it's Wednesday. What are we doing? Yeah. Like, we're supposed to be talking about love. Yeah. Man. Like, we you, care about each other's board states. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying, man. Like, I have my three or four go to guys. Like, I try to keep it really friendly in the community with everybody, but I mean, I have like Sakala and Bergerac and Cody Graham and just guys that like we know about each other's lives and stuff and what people are doing. And that, I think that's what the game is for, you know? Like, I'll build my own list. I'll find my own thing. You know, whatever. That's fine. I'll test I'll test or do whatever. But, like, what are you building here, right? Do you want to have four years of, like... When you when you talk about, like, the five, six, seven years, maybe in Drew's case, uh, 15 years playing Pokemon, <laughs> like, what came of it? A couple glass trophies and a couple stamped cards? Or, like, I met one of my homies playing Pokemon and now I'm, like, in his wedding, you know? Or, like, I'm his... I'm his kid's godson or something. That's the kind of stuff that, like... I feel like that would definitely happen on someone's PC. Oh, if yeah. anything, me and Chris were mad, we couldn't make Sosa's wedding. Yeah. Uh, we didn't get married and all that stuff. Like, that was that was super, super funny. Yeah. I... Um, but, yeah, I think that's kind of, like, how our team kind of feels about each other. If anything, on on regional days, we're all trying to convince each other not to play the trash decks. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're just like, like... Like, please don't play that deck that is garbage. I'm like, stop, leave me alone. I want to play Tyranitar. And they're like, all right, like, enjoy losing. I'm going to play this broken, busted deck, right? And then, like, we're all just, like, the whole room's on different decks. Not because, like, we're all, like, trying to hide it from each other like some other people do. We're all just like, I really like this Pokemon. And I think it's cute. So I'm going to play. We're going to play Swampert and Bully on it. Yeah, I'll try hard to go play or whatever, you know? And that's awesome, and, man. Like, honestly, um, someone's PC, I, for me personally, has been uh i i can't even explain um russ maybe six seven months ago when i was probably a relative unknown uh you gave me an opportunity to write for your website um which made me feel right at home and a lot of the hospitality that i got from people like you and drew and uh you know israel was i met him at my first regional and he was just out of this world kind to me even though he had a really bad matchup with me um that kind of stuff definitely gets remembered and noticed and talked about. So uh, thank you very much for, for all that stuff, man. I, I do appreciate it. And it's gotten me here. And without that, I don't know if I'd be as happy as I am now. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. Drew, we'll go with you, man. You, I don't know I don't know what else is left to say, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I got a couple shout-outs. Okay. Uh, shout-out to Someone's PC, um, <laughs> where I'm a member. <laughs> Shout out to Flipside Games <laughs> for the sponsorship and Ultimate Guard for supporting us. Um, and yeah, that's it. I'm I'm actually opposite of Russ. I love this format. I love Pokemon as a game. I think Pokemon's phenomenal. So I, I, I don't care what the format is. I love it. Weird, bro. I mean, I, 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 I want to love the game. I really do. And then they're like, all right, I'm going to walk away. And they're like, we're printing Flygon GX. I'm like, come on. And I'm back. <laughs> Why y'all do that to me? Um, Try to quick break. Yeah, Drew, um, I have to say, man, out of like all the people out there that have like, because I, I get a lot of support from a lot of different people, but I have I have never received support so purely from someone as I have from you. And I know you remember our, our discussions at Worlds and that kind of thing. And um, Absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate that stuff, man. I have to say, you two... Uh, whether you viewers out there believe it or not, these are two role model guys in the community, uh, whether f- for their authenticity or for their kindness, or both. And I think you get both in just huge amounts from these guys. And Peter's all right, too. Um, but these two are uh, are definitely gems. <laughs> Peter's okay, too. 
Uh, they're definitely gems in the community for sure. They've had my back this whole time, and I wouldn't be here giving you this video or any of the daily stuff that I try to do without these two. So guys, thank you so, so much for joining me tonight. Um, as for me, you guys know me by now. I'm Carl PZ Barone. You can find me on Twitter at PZPTCG. I stream on Twitch at PZ5 and also for Rare Candy some days when I'm not doing stuff like this. Um, if you like our videos, consider donating to us on Patreon. You could pledge as low as a dollar every month. Um, they, it gets you cool perks like getting your name at the end of videos, being able to ask questions, getting deck help, one-on-one um, -on -one stuff, depending on... Uh, how much your pledge is for me? I mean, a dollar. If you're if you're a dollar patron, just slide in my DMs. I'll do I'll do my best, right? Um, you get exclusive articles. There's just a lot of benefits to it, so consider it. Uh, there's a link down below, down in the description, if you want to get in on that. Otherwise, for Russ and Drew, uh, I wish you great luck this weekend and beyond. But yeah, guys, good luck this weekend. Safe travels. Have fun. Keep grinding. And that's about all we have. So for Russ, Drew, I'm Carl. Peace.